Hello and welcome to Weathersnap. It's Friday, the 24th of March. I'm Claire Nazir. And I'm Alex Deakin. Professor Alex, did you see the footage of the storm that hit California this week? It was powerful. Incredible scenes. Another spell of torrential rain in that part of the world, which needed it, but uh, they've seen an awful lot of rain over the course of this winter into spring, haven't they? And um, a couple of tornadoes as well. Now, that part of the United States, not renowned for its tornadoes, but California saw a couple with one violent storm. One hit Montebello, was rated as an EF1. It's thought that the peak winds of 110 miles an hour, which would make it the strongest tornado to hit the L.A. area since 1983. So what's that? 40 years. That's uh, crazy. Yeah. Really crazy. I mean, how many do they get per season? I, I think it's about 10. But, you know, the, the key thing is we know about tornadoes. They hit every state of America, but there's Dixie Alley, there's Tornado Alley, where obviously you get a lot more frequent uh, tornadic events. You don't really hear about it in California, though. No, you just don't. So you associate California with sunshine, but it's been far from that. All winter, really, an exceptionally wet winter, almost 150 percent of its average rainfall through the season so far. And according to The Guardian, California's unexpected siege of wet weather after years of drought has caused a few issues up in the mountains. So much snow that roofs have been crushed and crews have been sent to keep highways clear of avalanches. Yes, it's been quite crazy. Now, we've discussed atmospheric rivers before. Mm. Incredibly, the state of California has been battered by about 11 of these. So that is a surge of moisture, which actually just pushes up from the from the south, southwest. Um, and once it engages with low pressure systems, there's so much energy in the system. There's so much moisture and also warmth that obviously it can spin up these sort of really deep areas of low pressure. And that's exactly what happened this Tuesday. We saw a huge area of low pressure. In fact, some people were saying it's a hurricane. And in fact, if you look on the satellite pictures, there was a bit of a center to it where there was a sort of clear skies and on social media, people were taking photos saying, look, the storm has passed. There's some blue sky up there before it just came again. But it wasn't a hurricane. It was just this huge area of low pressure, which caused landslides, flooding, wind damage, hundreds of fallen trees. One, in fact, led to the derailment of a train and hundreds of thousands without power. So, Alex, yes, we, we don't use the term atmospheric river very often here in the UK and across Northwest Europe. But certainly we do get those sort of conveyor belts, don't we, of, yeah. of warm and moist air, which actually flows up. But this is quite rare for this part of the world. Absolutely. I mean, you, as you said earlier, you associate California with, with hot and sunny weather, but they do need, certainly the snowfall is vitally important on the mountains around California to keep them hydrated through the summer months. That's, that's what they use. They use the snow melt over the mountains uh, to provide them with water through the through the long, hot summers. So, you know, yeah, a lot of heavy rain, but it's not all bad news. And some, you know, it's very much needed because it has been a very, very dry couple of decades uh, across California, far more dry years uh, than wet years. Uh, and thanks to this very wet winter, most of the state is now free from drought or out of the droughts situation. So it is it is good news in some sense, but obviously all coming all at once with these gusts of winds, 80 mile an hour, widespread flooding, uh, avalanches being triggered. That That is not what you want to see. Los Angeles, I think, measured almost an inch and a half of rain in one day alone, uh, w- washing away the previous daily record for March the 21st of 1.34 inches. And that was set more than a century ago. And they've seen over six inches of rain in the city this month, making it the wettest March on record since 1995. And obviously, there's still still a week to go. So they might even top that record as well. Mammoth Mountain. What a great name for a mountain. Uh, <laughs> you need a thick coat to go up there. Uh, measured, what, 18 inches of snow on Wednesday, sending the seasonal snowfall to a total of 664 inches uh we're using inches of course because that's how they measure everything over in the united states but i have no idea what 664 inches is you can google it if you really want to know but it's just four inches shy of the all-time record uh which was set over a decade ago in 2010 into 2011 
In fact, I've read in some reports that some of the ski resorts are likely to stay open until June now, <laughs> which is great if you're a skier, I suppose. But, you know, that snow melt could be a problem once the heat really gets going again. But over the last 25 years, there's only been nine years across the state of California which have been wet and 16 have been dry. So I'm sure there's going to be more analysis on what's happened uh, this last three months across California to understand more about why, in particular, they've been stuck in this weather pattern. And that's one of the things, isn't it? It's just one cycle of weather. When you get too much of something, that's when you, you run into problems. And that's what we've been reading and, and hearing about in California. We're going to be talking about our weather in a minute, which has been relatively mild and quite mm. wet. Yeah. It's shifting again, Alex. Um, more about that in a moment. But before that, earlier this week, Graham Madge, our climate correspondent, just picked up the conversation with Chris Jones, a scientist and somebody who's a regular on our Mostly Climate podcast, on the latest IPCC report, uh, which is called the Synthesis Report, which summarises the state of knowledge of climate change and its widespread impacts and risks. We've heard a lot, Chris, about this IPCC report. Can you tell us what that included? Basically, the IPCC report brings together all of the strands of science from previous reports on understanding the physical science, the impacts that climate is having on people and the options and solutions available to us to really emphasise the seriousness of the situation that climate change is happening now. So there's a real urgency around the need to act, but we do have options. The solutions to climate change are becoming cheaper and cheaper and you know there are ways that we can tackle this that we know are available now. We've become I think quite familiar with these climate change reports. Each of them portrays quite a compelling narrative. What is it that's different about this one? There's a real renewed focus on the urgency. So we've known much of the science for many years that we've got enough information we need to act we're starting to see signs of action of reducing emissions. But, you know, in some ways we're starting too late. It really is urgent that we accelerate the process. What we're saying here is that this is the decade where we can really make progress or not. And the decisions we make now will resonate for the next century. We're also seeing a need for more equity. The countries who emit most and the sectors that emit most are not the ones who are most vulnerable. It's the poor and developing countries that are most vulnerable to climate change. So there's this real inequity of what's happening. This report isn't just about cutting greenhouse gas emissions, is it? It's looking at the importance of other factors like adaptation. What do you think are the most important things that the world needs to adapt to to manage the impacts from climate change? So adaptation is really important and the details of it vary regionally because the impacts of climate change are so different. You know, some places are seeing extreme heat, some places floods, some droughts. So the individual adaptation measures are very different. We also know that as climate continues to change, some of these adaptation measures themselves become limited. So they, they reach you know, the edge of what we can adapt to. We need to start seeing adaptation and mitigation, so emissions reductions going hand in hand. You know, one on its own isn't going to help us solve the problem. We need to be looking at both. The Paris Agreement, where a lot of the decisions on action on climate change were made, was back in 2015. Scientists have said that we need to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. What would you say to decision makers now, Chris, in terms of how quickly and how urgently they need to act? Those are exactly the words, quick and urgent. The IPCC is full of sentences that we need deep, rapid and sustained cuts in greenhouse gas emissions pretty much immediately. And that includes carbon dioxide, but also methane. You know, at current rates of our emissions, we will use up all the remaining carbon budget for one and a half degrees by the end of the decade. So we've got literally just a few years. You know, if we want to really get towards the one and a half degree level without exceeding it too much, we need to halve our emissions by 2030 and get down to about two thirds reductions by the mid 2030s. The scale of the challenge is enormous. Had we acted 10 years ago, it would have been easier. Emissions continue to increase and we've really got to pull our finger out and do something about it. 
Our thanks to not only Graham Madge, but also Dr Chris Jones, climate scientist here at the Met Office. Back to the UK now. Alex, you know, we saw 17 degrees Celsius this week. Mm -hmm. Really feels like the air is turning milder. I'm going to ask you about the weather in a moment. But first of all, Friday evening, this evening coming, any clear skies around? There will be, but only between the showers. What do you need clear skies for? Right. There's something okay, in the sky I'm... to look at. Yeah, there really is. And as an astrophysicist... I should know, shouldn't I? <laughs> yes, you're going to know. Shouldn't know. So, yeah, something very special happening in the sky this evening. And it's not the beautiful clouds we love to talk about and point at. No, this is something which is far more sort of astronomical. Look to the skies tonight and you'll see the moon and Venus, which will appear very close together in the night sky. You can see it anywhere in the world. But it's also lined up with a bright Jupiter, Mars and also a faint Uranus. I'm guessing you can only see Uranus with a telescope, though, right? Well, my sources at The New Scientist have suggested that you just need binoculars. But I'm sure you're probably well, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe because you've got the, you know, the astrophysics degree. That's why I'm looking to you. I'm nodding to you. Nodded, well, yeah. Well, it was, early, it was earlier this year. There was uh, Jupiter, Venus and Mars all lined up with the moon. And it just looked absolutely stunning. So we're throwing Mars into that mix, are we, as well now? Yeah? And Uranus. But yeah. they are going to, uh, yeah, you're definitely going to need binoculars for Uranus slash telescope but that will look <laughs> spectacular if you've got clear skies but it is a showery situation so there will be clear skies in places but there will also be showers in others as well mm, okay so we've seen lots of showers and um, it's going to be quite windy which disturbs the atmosphere and interferes with your view a little bit as well yeah how are we going to hold the binoculars really steady to you know to see this celestial dome it's going to be tricky isn't it it is it is but i think yeah. we will be able to do it OK, so we've got so we're in we're in this pattern. And in fact, I don't like the phrase, but I have used it this week. What have times. you used? You rinse and repeat. It is oh. one of those things which I know I know you're going to slap me on the wrist, aren't you? Because it's it's a bit cliche, but it really does describe what's happened this week. Yeah? It does. It does. I'm not a big fan of unsettled either as a word to describe the weather, but it kind of does. It does what it says on the tin for this week. Chopping and changing that time of year, right? So you've got a bit of power from the sun, a bit of welly, clouds are going to bubble up. You've got low pressure. You've got a south shifted jet stream, which isn't easy to say. Uh, and that's been generating what's been a pretty mixed week. Low pressure up to the northwest all week and just chugging away south, southwesterly winds, uh, just throwing up showers and showers and showers and showers and a bit more persistent rain in a few spots as weather fronts have drifted through. But yeah, basically, it's been a showery week. April showers have come up, what, two weeks early, but um, not unusual at this time of year. And, it, you know, it's good fun, isn't it? When one minute you look out the window, it's beautifully sunny. The next minute you look out, it's actually smashing it down. What's not to love? Mm, I don't know. I think if you're stepping out of a hairdresser's, it's a tricky one. It's a real lottery. Always carry an umbrella under these sorts of circumstances. OK, but then the winds shift. That's the key thing. This is what yeah. we're getting at now. It's, you know, the trend has changed yet again. So the low pressure that's been bringing us the showers all week or kind of a form of it drifts across the country on Saturday. And as it exits, <laughs> you're going to get a northerly wind setting up. So that northerly wind, I mean, actually the far north of Scotland never really got mild, whereas elsewhere further south, we've been 16, 17 at times this week. Uh, but yeah, as that moves away, northerly winds bring the colder air into Scotland during Saturday, Saturday night. And that colder air then spreads south. So we're all feeling chillier by Sunday. Not especially cold, nothing amazing about it temperatures in the south will probably still reach double figures on sunday in the sunshine but it will feel a lot colder and for the likes of aberdeen you know temperatures will be you know three four five degrees for much of the day and when you add that wind on it will feel sub-zero and there will be snow showers northern scotland and northeast england could see a few that's that'll be nice to see a dusting yeah well it's not going to last very long either is it we're calling nah. it a bit of a blip aren't we more than anything else not a snap should we go to Ollie Claydon with last week's highs and lows? Let's. Here are your UK weather extremes for the week Monday the 13th to Sunday the 19th of March. Pershaw College in Hereford and Worcestershire saw the highest temperature with 16.3 Celsius recorded on Friday. The coldest place was Tindrum in Perthshire where the mercury dropped to minus 9.9 degrees Celsius. Capel Keurig in Gwynedd was the wettest place with 85.8 millimetres of rainfall and the sunniest place of the week was Jersey, which enjoyed 10.4 hours of sunshine on Saturday. 
So thanks very much to Ollie Claydon, Chris Jones, uh, Graham Madge, obviously my my co-worker, my friend, my colleague, Alex Deacon. What are you doing this weekend, Alex? My mum and dad have come, are they? Yes. My folks <laughs> are coming down from Yorkshire, so it'll be good to see them and uh, running the football team on Sunday as well. Oh, brilliant. Well, I hope everybody wins. Everyone's a winner in that situation. Your parents are great for so many reasons. And they're migrating south, so they're going to pick up a little bit more solar radiation the further south they go. Excellent work. OK, we'll have a lovely weekend. And thanks very much to you guys for listening and supporting this podcast. It's great to have your company and we'll see you next week. Thanks very much. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.